Stanford University. Thanks everybody for your time today. So I thought it may be interesting for me just to start off um, why I got into the business and wh where I saw uh, the opportunity. So back in 2004 um, is where the idea came up. Um, I was en route to Burning Man with uh, my, uh, my cousin uh, who, uh, if this room goes silent. Burning Man's actually a very fun place. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of sun. Uh, and creative ideas come out of there too. Uh, anyway, so we had a software company um, doing enterprise software. And it has its need, but it gets boring after a while. Um, uh, after managing that company for, for eight years, we really wanted to try something new. My brother and I are extremely passionate about the environment. We, we realized that one area that has the ability to scale uh, and continue to scale is, is solar. So we looked at the, the value chain and thought, where, would be the, where could we add the most value? We went to the Solar Power Conference in DC in 2005. The uh, conference was tiny. Uh, total uh, attendance was about five to 800 people. So really, really small. And most of the people there, <laughs> uh, most of the people there um, was, was focused on technology. Um, and we're in one room, and the question came up, to the installers, what are you doing to reduce your cost? And the answer was, we're waiting for the technology to drop their price. I was like, well, you know, that sounds like an opportunity to me. If everybody's focused on technology and no one's focused on delivery, how's this going to play out? Um, we had the opportunity to go into technology, um, but it's a very risky bet, because you're betting on something and eventually it's going to come down to the lowest cost, highest quality kilowatt hour. That's the technology that's going to win. So unless you are a true uh, technology genius and can come up with that answer, that's a big bet, because then you're betting on someone else. I'm not a technolog uh, technologist. Uh, I'm a business person. So I didn't have the skill in that area. But then, then we realized that delivery is the most fragmented no one's focused on it, and uh, is the area that needs most support. So we started Solar City, and um, the vision was pretty simple: make solar affordable and cause large adoption. If you can't make, if it's not affordable, adoption won't occur. If adoption doesn't occur, we don't solve the problem. So we have to solve the problem, and the only way you get to solve the problem is not by deploying thousands, not tens of thousands, eventually millions of systems will move the needle. Uh, so you have to address every single barrier. So we got started, um, just myself, my brother, in, in his kitchen, and um, started knocking down the first barriers. Uh, ironically enough, the first barrier was just uh, for a homeowner to be able to call someone. Uh, you, you'd be surprised that uh, three years ago, homeowners would not know who to call for a quality solar installation. They just, it, there weren't any really uh, established companies. So we built, built that out. But the cost was still big, and the average system was around $30,000. So we said, okay, we've got to do something to reduce the cost. And we started looking at what are, what are the big cost factors. One of the big cost factors was efficiency throughput of our organization. Meaning, if you go into one area and you install one home, and you come back, three weeks later you dispatch someone again to that same area to install a new home, it would have been a lot more efficient to install two homes in that same week. So we launched what we call a, uh, our community program. But if you get a community to go solar all at once, you can offer them a large discount as the company's efficiency improves. So you're just essentially passing that cost, back, that cost savings back to them. Um, this really worked well. So we launched our first com uh, community program in Portola Valley. Then we launched our second one. I think it was actually here in Stanford. And we've launched about 22 or 23 community programs across uh, California and Arizona. But 
it still had this massive number. So even if we were able to reduce the cost by 10%, um, you still had uh, homeowners needing to spend about $25,000. So we knew that the way to address that problem is to provide financing. So we, we try to get financing early on in the process. But when you go to a bank and you say you have this creative idea on how to finance systems, uh, and the bank asks you, how much money do you need? Your natural intention is to ask for a little, because you don't want to ask for too much. The um, irony with that is, if you ask for little, they go, it's not worth their time. So we first asked for five or 10 million, and we got no, no, no. Then we asked for 100 million, and we got a yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but you had to build the credibility to be able to deploy 100 million. So if we just went out asking for 100 million, uh, that wouldn't have worked either. Um, but through the community programs, building enough scale in the organization, expanding through California, we, we built enough size to convince the first bank, which happened to be Morgan Stanley, to, to give us a $100 million fund. That really changed the value proposition to the uh, homeowner. So with this, we were able to use the tax credits, use the depreciation benefits, use the rebates, take that into the fund, and return, give a customer a lower cost per kilowatt hour than what they're currently paying for electricity. So if you are a homeowner, and your electric bill is $200, um, using uh, our solar lease program, your new electric bill and your uh, lease payments will add up to about $170. So you'll be saving $30 a month with no investment and using clean power. Given the option, you know, most people choose cheaper, cleaner power. And to me, that's, like, that's the big opportunity. Um, now the company is just going through this growth spurt and, and addressing the market. We did, we did uh, however, hit a stumbling block um, the beginning of the year. Um, who of you are familiar with, with the tax equity market or the uh, um, tax, solar tax credits? Are all of you familiar with that? Okay. Well, so I've got some yes and some no. Let me just give you the uh, four sources of income when you are financing a solar system. The first is a federal tax credit of 30%. The second is the depreciation va asset, a value of that asset. The third is the rebate. And then the fourth is the customer payments. Customer payments is actually only 20% of the entire system value. The other 80% is either rebate or um, federal subsidies. That, that's essentially the, the difference. Um, so, so where I was going that uh, train of thought. So, so by adding those subsidies together, we, we were able to package a solution for a tax equity investor, but there we get a decent return, fairly safe return, um, by uh, owning solar assets. We'd be managing it for them, and the homeowner would just get a fixed monthly bill, and it would be a guaranteed uh, result. So if we told the homeowner uh, that unit will pr uh, produce 10, uh, 10 electrons uh, and only produced nine, uh, we'd pay them that difference. So we really, really did focus on making sure you take away all the risk factors uh, for the customer. But back to the stumbling block that we, we hit in the beginning of the year. So in order to value the asset, you as a bank need to have profits to which you can write off the, the tax credit. You know, how many banks were there making money at um, the end of last year and beginning of this year? So, so the tax equity market came to a, a grinding halt. Um, no banks wanted to invest into solar assets as they just couldn't value the tax credits. Um, we, we were able to close one intermediate fund, a very small one, that kept us going. And then um, in the stimulus package, there was a small change and they made the tax credit a cash grant. In essence, it's the same cost to the government. It's just a timing issue when it gets paid out. Um, so that now has opened up the tax equity market again, and banks are starting to get back into the space. 
um, this has made it possible for us to grow. Uh, we, um, Q1 to Q2 was flat. Um, uh, Q3 of this year over Q2 uh, was 3x Q2. Q4 over Q3 is going to be 4x over Q3. So it's as fast as you can go. We, we've hired over uh, 120 people in the last 120 days, almost one every day. And this is mainly people on roofs installing solar systems. Um, the market availability is, is essentially endless. I'm just going to grab some water over here. So, so just a show of hands. Um, how many solar systems do you think uh, have been deployed through all of the US over the last 30 years? Uh, I'm, I'm going to give out some numbers and, and see how many hands give up. Uh, 500,000 systems. Any? any? Are you going up or going down? I'm, I'm going. Uh, <laughs> well, do you guys want me to go up or down? <laughs> uh, this is a fairly educated group, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. 100,000 systems. 60,000 systems. Uh, that's, that's the answer. OK, so, <laughs> so it's, just, it's just a little under 60,000 systems. This is through all of the US over the last 30 years. You can do that in like the peninsula fairly easily. Um, so it's, 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 when, I, when I go out raising funding, I often get asked this the typical VC question. So what's the market opportunity? Have you calculated your TAM? Um, and, and I think myself, no, we actually went down that route. I'm like, no, it's a waste of time. It's literally a million homes is $50 billion or $30 billion in revenue. So it's, and doing a million homes is not uh, out of the question. It's, it's, there are a million homes. A million homes use power. If you provide them co uh, lower cost power, why won't they adopt it? So the addressable market, in my opinion, in the US is, uh, for this group, infinite growth in our lifetimes. As fast as you can grow and as much as you can deploy in our lifetimes uh, is the solar market. As the new housing stock that's been developed, even this down economy, I think it's around 280, 300,000 new homes in the US this year. So your your deployment of solar systems, even if it doubled or tripled, um, doesn't even keep up to the new development. So we still have this massive stock that we have to deploy solar systems to. So not only do we have to exceed new development, we have to catch up on the existing stock. Uh, so that's, that's going to take a long time. Uh, so that, that's, that's essentially the, the summary of uh, why we got into it, uh, our focus is addressing every single barrier to adoption, the biggest one being the upfront cost. Now we've addressed that, is addressing the next barriers and the next barriers. And a small incremental improvement, after three years you step back, you go, wow, we actually did something that's, that's quite nice. But if you shoot out um, and starting a business, trying to do the big thing, you know, like trying to boil the ocean, you're not going to get anywhere. So just do incremental improvements. Uh, you get somewhere. Th that, that's the story of Solar City. Not much more than that. It's a simple business. You install solar systems on people's roofs. Just make sure it, uh, quality and service is great, um, and provide them a value proposition that they can't say no to, and it, the rest will happen. Now, start to questions. Okay, go ahead. Um, you said the federal government steps in with subsidies. You said they're rebates. Where do the rebates come from? Okay, so the rebates are um, utility driven. So each utility has its own own rebate program. Um, so in California, it, there's this new program called uh, CSI, Solar uh, California Initiative. There, the program is designed to benefit early adopters. So um, the earlier you adopt the solar system, the higher the rebate. So often I get uh, customers saying, you know, the cost of solar technology has come down quite aggressively over the last year. Uh, would I be better off uh, just waiting another year uh, or going solar now? The cost has come down, but the net cost to the consumer hasn't changed much at all. 
And the reason being is over the last year, the rebate has also dropped. And it's about a 10 cent difference. Um, so it's actually a small, small, um, you wouldn't have benefited if you, if you waited in, in California as the, the rebate and the system cost drop were at parity, or very close. In states like Arizona, they have uh, decent rebates. Oregon, which is our other market, by the way, um, no, sunny Oregon. The, um, there they have a, a rebate program, plus they have a state incentive of 50%. So we were able to sell solar systems at around seven cents a kilowatt hour in uh, Oregon, as we're in pg and &E territory, our solar systems come at about 22, 23 cents a kilowatt hour. And we have less production per kilowatt. Go ahead. My question then is, you know, looking at the market, your typical average whatever customer is how many dollars a month before they get their installation? So repeat the question. Oh, I'm so saying, everybody yeah. else can hear. The question is demographics or typical customer. So our typical customer in California needs to be in the th uh, tier three um, bracket. So for those who don't know, PG&E, uh, actually most of California, uh, has different tiers for electricity. So you have tier one and tier two, it's essentially your baseline. And then tier three is a big increase, tier four is even bigger, and tier five is, is massive. So it starts off at 11 cents per kilowatt hour, and tier five is at 42 cents per kilowatt hour. So, so there's a big range, and it's, the more you use, the more expensive it is. There are states, believe it or not, that the more you use, you get a discount, which that drives me nuts. Um, but the, uh, so, so the more you use, the more expensive it is. If you want to see a savings, you have to be in tier three and tier four. Um, but we do have a lot of customers that don't mind paying 10 or $15 more a month for clean power. So it's, that typically is our, our demographic. Also typical for the fifty thousand. Um, no, it's more like thirty thousand. Yeah. I have two questions. Um, when would you uh, do you do tractors uh, like the two axles tractors to increase the efficiency? And if not, uh, would you consider using uh, some latest technology of inverter to get the system to be more efficient? Yeah, it's a, just to repeat the question, so there's two questions. One is, what do you look at uh, tracking systems for a solar system to increase the uh, production? That's question one. Question two, will you look at other technology um, associated with the inverter to improve uh, production? Um, tracking systems, I, I'm skeptical about tracking systems, and I'll I I tell you why. Uh, two years ago, Panels were sold for about $4 a watt. That, that was the, the market price. Today, it's around $2.50 a watt. Two years ago, tracking systems made a lot of sense because your, for every kilowatt hour you could maximize, um, uh, you'd save a lot in, in not needing to buy those additional kilowatts. But your um, support and maintenance fees go up. Before, one nice thing about solar systems is there's no moving parts. You just put it there and, you know, in certain areas, you don't even need to keep it clean. It keeps it clean itself. Um, <laughs> Mine does. Mine does. <laughs> <laughs> Depends, the, the, uh, our customers actually, we, we've, I'll get to that in a second, but let me, uh, <laughs> let me, let me answer that question. The, um, uh, so with the additional tilt um, and production gain, that, that conversion point is starting to occur. It's still cheaper, and you still, it's a still better return to install a tracking system today. Um, I, I'm skeptical that it will be a long-term solution. And the other part is the uh, owning and operating of that tracking system. Uh, there's no long-term history on it. So you're dealing with moving devices. Uh, in severe weather conditions um, over a 25-year period. Uh, I think if it's such a close call, um, I'm skeptical about that. 
On the inverters, we've actually spent a fair amount of time here. Um, there's been a big trend on um, what, what they've been calling AC panels. So panel technology comes out in, in DC, and then it goes through the inverter and uh, gets converted into uh, alternating current. Um, the industry's weak spot is the inverter. It's by far the number one failing point. The panels in our uh, history, we don't have panel failure. It just it never occurs. What you have is inverter failure. Um, so you have to go out and replace the inverter. So we've deployed uh, AC inverters, and quite a bit of them. And we, we find that all inverters, the AC and the, uh, the little inverters and the big inverters, have about a 10% uh, failure rate. So it's, it's fairly high. Um, it's, it's actually a bell curve, so it's, it's just in the beginning. And then once it's gone through the first six months of burning in, it tends, to, uh, tends not to fail. But of those first six months, we have about a 10% failure rate. So it's very high. May I ask one question? That, uh, so, so, so this is great. Um, we actually tested all the brands. And um, when we negotiate with our vendors, the uh, vendors always say, no, we, we the uh, primo, primo brand. Our quality is the greatest and greatest. And we look at it, really? Well, if I had your stats against this guy, it's exactly the same. So um, all of them are around the same. They're, they're all the same. Now, there's no effect to the customer, because all that happens is we, might, we see the event. The customer experiences maybe two days of downtime. We go out there, replace it, everything's fine. I guess I'm uh, one of the lucky ones. I have 18 kilowatt installed in 2005, and uh, nothing happened. All I have to do is I have to clean the solar panel. Yeah, see, that's, that's most of our customers. That's 90% of them. There are no solar cities, so we have some power uh, solar. Ah, uh, you're in deep trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> What's the cost installed today uh, for a kilowatt? So for a homeowner, you're probably looking at about six fifty to seven dollars per watt, or six six uh, six thousand five hundred, seven thousand per kilowatt um, pre subsidies. So um, depending on your rebate size, and that, and that gets reduced, but just your gross amount. Is a around six fifty to seven dollars a watt. So in the, in a uh, you you quoted the prices for panels, but the the a significant fraction of the cost is the sort of balance of system. Like yeah, it's the combination of the inverters and how much trenching and wiring and <coughs> you know attaching the cells to something. Is there any prospect for those for that that uh, side of the cost to come down? Absolutely. So, so the the biggest prospect for that is um, scale. So getting efficiency throughput is, is amazing what it does to your, your cost of goods. Um, Solar City was not profitable in the beginning of the year because we had low throughput. With high throughput, we're profitable. So um, and I've, what happens is you have your fixed part of cost of goods that uh, if you push more volume through it, it just increases your gross margins. That, that's the biggest uh, cause for uh, reduction in the, loss in the balance of the system cost, including uh, installation. Then smaller reasons for balance of system cost reductions is just addressing the single components. So looking at the mounting equipment, can, can you create your own mounting equipment at a lower cost? Will that improve uh, crew efficiency? The other efficiency is uh, by implementing technology to make sure that you always have the right materials in the warehouse. I know this sounds like a simple task, but it's not. Um, you often have your crew lead you know, racing down to Home Depot to get some components. Um, when he is going down that route, uh, often the crew is stopped. So then that causes an efficiency loss. The psyche of an installer, if he um, looks at the schedule, and sees that he's got work for the entire month, he works fast. If he looks at the schedule and sees he's got work for the next three days, he works a little slower. <laughs> Go ahead. How about here? Um, so you mentioned that your customer payments only account for about 
20% of the cost of the total system, is that right? Um, so if you scale up considerably, aren't you a little worried that maybe the government might decide to scale back on some of these subsidies and it's going to start costing them a lot of money? Um, very good point. This is actually a, an interesting uh, comment. Um, today, solar is a subsidized market. It does not work without subsidies. Let's be clear there. Um, even with subsidies in, in places like California, the cost per kilowatt hour for residents is coming around 22 cents a kilowatt hour. So that, that's still very high. Um, you know, the grid power, the buying that's uh, five or six cents per kilowatt hour. The ITC, the tax credit, has been around for, it's been now has been extended for eight years. So the industry has eight years to figure out scale and reduction to, to get to that point. So there's two things that are going to happen. One, the cost of power is going to come, uh, the cost of solar power is going to come down. And the second is the cost of power is going to go up. And we're hoping that takes, that, that's less than eight years. <laughs> we really hope. Um, but to that point, uh, I just recently um, uh, read a study um, about subsidies for, for renewable energy and for fossil fuels. And I've always heard rumor mill about you know, fossil fuels get a lot of subsidy. And this is the first study actually quantified and broke, broke it down. So here's the actual number. Fossil fuel over the last six years got um, 76 billion in federal subsidies. Um, renewable uh, power got 29 billion in federal subsidies. Um, and renewable meaning everything, wind, biomass, solar, all forms of renewable. So don't ask me why we're still uh, subsidizing coal. Um, solar only got one billion. Yeah, but uh, but this is this is just over the last six years for all renewables. The the study didn't break down solar versus wind or any of the others, but it's um, the point is just fossil fuels got you know, more than double of of renewable. Okay, so I saw one back here somewhere, and then we'll. Wander over to this side. Just a quick question about the business model. So, who has to the liability? What is the liability side? You know, warranty because the system has been working for 10 years. Is it you or is it the manufacturer? So, so, so all, all liability, warranty, everything falls onto us. So, that, this, this is our, our system. We own it. Oh, let, let me be clear. We have a lot of customers that buy cash. And in that case, it's just a manufacturing warranty associated with the, with the equipment. Um, we have a 10-year service obligation uh, to that customer. For all systems that are leased, th those are our systems. So anything that goes wrong, it's our responsibility. Um, and we will lean on the uh, um, panel manufacturer or the inverter to, to honor their warranties if something goes wrong um, with their equipment. Um, let's see now. Let me do this in some sort of fair order. There, I saw one back over in the back there somewhere. <laughs> No, How about here? Big, but the question was answered about the subsidies. Fair okay. enough. How about here? Do you see your mechanism being applied in other countries? Is it viable today to do that in? Uh... Absolutely. The, you, you face the same problems everywhere. So it's, it's really important to get scale into this business. Um, the largest market in the world, is, as you all know, is Germany. Um, and their residential market is actually not so big. Their residential market is fa fairly small. Um, so what we find slightly different is it's easy to go upscale, it's hard to come downscale. So we, um, our company operates profitably just on a residential business, and then the commercial business is just incremental. Um, as where you, if you just depend on commercial, it's, it's very difficult to manage a business because it's, it's, it's spiky. As where residential tends to be a formula, you spend X amount in marketing, you get X close rate, conversion rate, and adoption. Um, and you, see you can forecast that. But I do, I do think it can scale uh, worldwide. What are the prospects for expansion of your company into other states aside from the ones that you've mentioned so far? So we, um, we did our, what we call our own solar affordability index. Um, and we looked at those, uh, the ingredients we looked at there are slightly different. So how much sun exposure is in that state, what's the cost of power, and then um, what's the subsidy level. 
uh, looking at those three ingredients, there are 14 states that have better economics than California. So um, we plan to expand to about six new states next year and probably another six after that uh, as, as the market's ready. Um, a lot of these states, their solar program, and why they're unfamiliar to, to this group, is their solar programs are very uh, specific. So some of them will have no system larger than 10 kilowatts. So you don't hear of the, what was that bad word you said earlier? The, the, oh, she left, uh, some power. <laughs> the, you don't hear of the um, uh, large integrators like some power, because some power arguably is the, the largest solar integrating company in, in the US, but they do megawatt systems. Uh, most of those states won't work for them because it's just uh, it's too small a program. Um, how about zero? I think I saw that one next. Um, can you tell us more details about the tax credit equity with the bank that you mentioned at the beginning? How sure. So when they, this is different than, than just pure debt. Um, when raising tax equity, what they're buying uh, is essentially this tax credit. So you have, to, you have to establish a partnership where the legal entities have the rights to own the system and then pass the tax benefits onto whatever corporation, let's say Bank A. That structuring is very complicated uh, and very expensive. Our first tax equity deal that we did, just the legal cost cost one and a half, uh, 1.2 million. Uh, just legal cost. Um, I'm convinced the, the lawyers make sure that it stays complicated. That's just my, um, my personal feeling. Oh, this is the most complicated thing out there. Absolutely. This, although we've done it 50 times, this is really, really complicated. It's going to cost you two, $300,000 to do this. And so if they tell everybody that, they keep, keep it going. That's just my theory. It may actually really be complicated. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but since then, uh, average transaction cost is about two or $300,000 for every fund. Um, that you establish in, in making sure that all the entities are, are legal um, and that it works so you don't, you don't face any tax recapturing issues. Because if you get the cap uh, tax credit, um, you've got to make sure that the structure doesn't collapse and that um, the, the IRS doesn't come back and grab, it, grab back that, that tax credit. Here's a, a common flaw in that. You often see a solar lease, um, when we launched solar lease, there were a bunch of little competitors that launched too. And they were not operating leases. They were finance leases. Uh, and a big test is what is, what is the buyout value at the end? If the person's offering you for a dollar, I'd be highly skeptical because then it's, then it's a, a finance lease instead of a, an operating lease. The, the buyout value has to be fair market value. So one back here, and then we'll go down here, and then from there. Yeah. Isn't it true that um, you produce more energy than you consume, uh, that PG&E does not uh, pay you for that difference? And, and if it is true, why, why is that? So it's a mixed answer. The answer is it was true. Um, the, the There's now... Uh, the PC has now proved that the utilities will pay you back. They haven't finalized on the price yet. Um, but the outcome will most likely be at wholesale. So today, when you sell to the utility, you, you're net metering your, your, your meter. Um, so you're essentially selling it back to the utility at retail. For the overproduction, historically, it's been you just give that to, to the utility. Um, there's a lot of momentum now in California where the overproduction, um, you'll get paid for it. The pricing is still up for debate. How many manufacturers do you, I mean, are you dealing with? Um, what kind of contract is specifically you have with them? Yeah, the, we've actually dealt with almost all of them. Um, but today, we, we've, uh, our primary panel manufacturers is, is Evergreen and First Solar. Um, we've chosen them, one, because they're made in the U.S., and two, both those are, are environmentally the very friendly panels. Um, with that being said, it is getting difficult to stay strictly with them as a lot of the Chinese panel manufacturers, uh, 
the quality is improving and the cost is coming down a lot. So it's something that we will have to consider. So one down here and over here and then one back there. Um, it, it looks like we do, from an engineering standpoint, you're essentially putting a lot of small units on houses in a community, um, but it's really part of a network. So the, so the, the energy flows in all directions in reality. Um, it wouldn't be, I mean, I'm just looking at the economy of scale to say, look, we've got 100, 100 uh, houses want this. We can put all those panels on a, on a Costco warehouse where we have much better control, we have economy of scale, you know, we, we, the inverters all, it just makes a lot more sense. I mean, this is the only reason individual house is apparently politically, political as far as I can figure, from, a, from an engineering point of view. Well, it's not it, really benefiting that house too much because it's, it's transparent to the owner. Sure, because it actually does meet, meet it back, but it may benefit the next door neighbor's house. Um, if, if you could do small, if you could do systems in community areas, absolutely, that, that could make sense. So if you had a, uh, if you had a Costco or whatever warehouse and, a, and homes surrounding it, uh, you could do that. Well, the whole thing to have surrounded is all on the grid anyway. The, the cost to transmit that far is nothing. The, um, sure, but wh why wouldn't that power be applied to the Costco building itself? So, so let's just use your uh, warehouse uh, concept. Costco uses a lot of power. So wouldn't, wouldn't that power first be consumed by Costco? It's consumed by whoever consumes it, but the assumption here is there's more power being created than is being consumed, it's being pumped into the grid. It makes more sense to put all in one location. Sure. Rather than a lot of little houses, we have all these different roofs, you got all these different supports, you got all these different uh, inverter problems, all these different wiring and everything else. If you can just gang it up in one big bus. <coughs> so that, that works if you have the space available. Um, in most of the areas that we serve, you, you don't. Because even in the uh, buildings with big fat roofs, they have high consumption. So if you were to put a solar system there, they would consume their power as well. So you're not, there is no exporting availability, unless that's an empty warehouse. Um, and there are some of those warehouses, especially down south. But over here, where would you install it? I think I saw one down here. Yeah, yes. What is the gross margin? <laughs> 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 is it still negative? Or? No, no, gross margin, no, we're, making, we're making money. Um, the, coming from software, uh, the gross margin is, is relatively small. So the average gross margin is around 20 to 30 percent. What percentage of that goes to Morgan Stanley? That's net of Morgan Stanley's, uh, uh, that's our gross margin. Okay. Yeah. Because you borrowed $100 million, right? It wasn't a borrowed, it, they, I mean, they invested it, so there's no debt. So um, it seems like the um, utility is getting a direct gain as, as this model grows larger in that it's load curve is getting flatter, like there's less need for peaking. Um, is that monetized at all in this, the current system? Um, so, so that's the solar industry's position, is that um, we should be compensated for the peak value of our, elect uh, our electricity versus just the standard value of the electricity. The utilities, depending on which utilities you speak to, um, they have a different opinion. Um, uh, with that note, uh, our utility, PG&E, is actually one of the, the best utilities to work with and has been most supportive for solar than, any other, uh, than, than most of the other utilities. That's the Overland side. Over. To, the, to this gentleman's point here, uh, isn't net metering what's limiting these big box uh, stores from really populating their roofs? So, so if you add in a feeding tariff um, to... Uh, these big roofs, and then it is a different selling proposition. Then your selling proposition to the big box is, um, I'll rent your roof, and in return, I get to install solar systems, and my income comes from the, the feeding tariff, however it is structured. But I want to caution that feeding tariff, Germany is the, the largest market in the world, and the reason for their adoption is the feeding tariff. Feeding tariff program, are you guys familiar with what a feeding tariff is? Okay, so with, with a, a California law, you can only, uh, 
your solar system can only produce power for the meter that it serves. So if you have a, a big building and it goes through one meter, whatever that meter is, uh, uh, whatever it, it moves back, that's all that a power can serve. So if, if, if it uses 100 kilowatt hours and you install a system that uh, produces 120 kilowatt hours, uh, those 20 kilowatt hours just get lost. That's net metering. So you only meter that meter. Um, a feeding tariff, uh, and it's also net of your consumption. So it first goes into the building. If the building is not consuming the power, then it moves out. Um, so it's on the uh, customer side of the meter. A feeding tariff is where you're not selling to the customer, you're selling to the utility. So it's on the utility side of the meter. So it can be the same installation, except you're tying over here instead of over here. Um, and then by tying over here, you actually don't meet you don't even uh, impact the customer's electric usage as you're just feeding directly into the grid. Um, and then the utility is paying you per kilowatt hour. That can work. Um, uh, but it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. There's a lot of momentum behind feeding tariffs. It's not the solution. So it's, it's, a, it's a careful balance. So they launched a feeding tariff in Spain. Um, the incentive for the feeding tariff was too rich. Within one year, they did 2.5 uh, gigawatts of solar. Um, all of the US last year did, I think, around 400 megawatts. So in one year, a version market did 2.5 gigawatts. This year, they're doing 500 megawatts. So for any business there, they are hurting right now. Because um, I don't know about you, but when you ramp up and then you have to ramp down, that really sucks. So um, when, when designing the feeding tariff, it's, it's a very difficult program to do because you have to make sure that it's not too rich, but at the same time, not too poor. Um, and I'll take it back. California actually does have a feeding tariff. It's at 15 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, we've had it for about a year, just a little over a year and a half. Um, not one kilowatt's been installed because it just doesn't make financial sense. Now, what about the power purchase agreement? Is, isn't that a, a poor man's feed-in tariff? So the power purchase agreement is a power purchase agreement between the uh, system owner and the building owner. So it's, not, it's nothing to do with the utility. Um, PG&E has a power purchase agreement you'll buy back. Oh, okay. So this is, you're talking about a, a large PPA where, where the utility gets into the PPA with the um, uh, provider. It comes in at like 30 kilowatts. I forget the exact exact limits. Where, where you? No, so, so let's be clear. So there's, there's two different types of power purchase agreements. There's one where you hear the big announcements where PG&E may close a 200 megawatt deal with Abengoa to install a large... Um, solar thermal system. Um, there they're taking tax credits and they're coming up with a customized price. The price is not disclosed. It's, it's a customized price. So that's, that's utility scale PPAs. Um, business scale PPAs, um, the, you're selling the power to the customer, not to the utility. And, you, and the customer's getting the power from you Applying that power to their building, if their building is not using the power, then it's moving the meter backwards. Okay, but on the PG&E slash tariffs, there is a section for power purchase agreement <coughs> with like 10 or 15 year contract periods at rates varying between like 9 cents and 21 cents a kilowatt hour. But no, you, you think I'd know about that, but I don't. So uh, I'm not familiar with that. Sure. What is your position on the IPV and like new house building? Do you like twenty billion in this market? So, um, do you guys all know what BIPV is? Uh, so it's, it's b yeah. building integrated uh, uh, PV. So um, the primary benefit is aesthetics. Uh, in fact, that's probably the only benefit. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah it's probably the only benefit is is, is aesthetics. Um, I see a lot. I see a lot of. Um, Hope for it. Uh, the, uh, a large barrier to adoption is aesthetics. Um, uh, uh, BIPV, however, is just so grossly expensive. 
that um, even consumers that want it, when you give them the two options, they take the non-BIPV just because it's, it's so expensive. So what will be your solution to address those uh, cities with all high rises and no, no flat and low houses where you can mount your uh, rooftop panels? This is not the application. Solar will never get there. That it's just, uh, we work well, or solar works well, um, but we need surface area. Even at 100% efficiency, it still wouldn't work. And we're not going to get to 100% efficiency. You probably signed several non-disclosure agreements about technologies that are not available to uh, customers yet in terms of panel efficiency and so forth. <coughs> are we, uh, so I won't ask you to uh, violate those, of course, unless you want to, but uh, <laughs> the, are we basically looking at a pretty slow, gradual, decade, level of uh, improvement, or do you think there are going to be some step functions that will uh, help us get uh, more efficient sooner? Can't tell you. No, I'm kidding. The, uh, the I, I'm actually, I'm hoping for the step functions. I think reality would be um, uh, just constant improvement, so slow steps. So I, I don't see this big leap occurring. The big leaps will occur in efficiency, but it's not going to happen with cost. Um, I, I have a question back on inverters. Can we compare the local DC to DC to boost um, solution and a central inverter with the microinverter solution versus the standard central inverter solution? Can we compare it to those three options? And what are your thoughts on that? So, um, um, let me understand the question correctly. So you're thinking um, microinverters behind the, the panel that takes the DC to AC, that's option one. Then you have microinverters, which aren't really inverters. They actually just keep it at DC, but they do more of the um, uh, uh, maximum point tracking. So more like the um, uh, magic device. Is that the one you're thinking of? And then the final one is just the um, uh, Plain old inverter. Okay, so, so just technology-wise, just uh, once again, I'm not a technologist, so don't go too deep into this. If you want that, get the other founder, Peter. Um, the, the, th the three different ways, uh, you have your AC inverter, which is a small inverter that sits behind the panel. Um, there, a, a well-known company is called Enphase that does that. Um, then you have uh, a... Another inverter, was well, not really inverter, it's just a device that sits behind the panel that uh, tracks the best performance of the panel based on shading or, and sunlight conditions. But it's still uh, in DC. It still runs through and then eventually connects into a, a final inverter. Um, and then you get the standard inverter. Uh, we've tested all three. Um, uh, end phase. Uh, at least not in phase, the AC inverter has a lot of promise. Uh, but because we are the system owners, uh, we just want to give it a little more time. Um, as if, one, if you have 10% failure, which is the historical average, uh, and you have 10 panels, you're guaranteed to do a truck roll to that house again. That means we roll a truck to every house twice, guaranteed. Um, so until we have strong data, that's, that's not the case. Um, we're going to give it a little time. With the uh, device that just tracks the DC aspect and to, to its maximum potential, that's good. But right now, the uh, electricity benefit um, is lower than the cost. So um, it, just, it doesn't make sense to do it. And then the standard inverters, uh, you know what you're getting. Um, the companies are fairly stable, and they can iron their warranties. So that's the, that's the place where we are today. Uh, but it's definitely not the place we're going to stay. We'll do one more, and then we'll uh, say goodbye to the big group and handle a few more of these. What about the cleaning? I always have to clean my panels. <laughs> <laughs> have you guys tracked? Um, I encourage you to track the difference between cleaning your panels and, and not cleaning it. 
Um, it's dust on it. I drop about 15% out So you, yours actually drops about 15. Okay, that's different. So the data that we have is it's about a 5% drop. But my panels are fairly flat. Okay, that, that's the big difference. So most of our customers have... You don't get any rain. So it hasn't rained all summer. That's right. It doesn't rain in the summer. The, um, which is great about California in, in some aspects. The, uh, um, when we, when do, we do the designs for our customers, we build in dust and, and dirt into the production estimates. Um, a lot of our customers who are tilted correctly um, don't need to clean the panels. It, it's still, uh, I mean, they get a better performance if they do clean it, no, no doubt about it. Uh, but we build in into our production guarantees that they don't have to in certain areas. In other areas, you have to. I mean, just go to spray it down. Well, please, uh, please join me in thanking them. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.